NetSparker, the developers of a comprehensive automated web security platform that includes web vulnerability scanning, assessment, and management. NetSparker's desktop and cloud-based security solutions employ a unique and dead accurate vulnerability scanning engine that automatically verifies vulnerabilities and provides a proof of concept. For more information, visit them on the web at securityweekly.com forward slash NetSparker. The biggest problem in security that remains unsolved is flat networks inside the cloud and data center that allow threats to move laterally and compromise vulnerable targets. But micro-segmentation using traditional firewalls is too complex and time-consuming. There's a better approach, Edgewise Zero Trust Auto Segmentation. Edgewise is impossibly simple micro-segmentation. Using the identity of machines and software that are communicating, Edgewise offers the strongest protection that adapts automatically to changes. Protect any application in any cloud without any changes to your network by visiting Security Week com forward slash edgewise. Welcome back everyone to Paul's Security Weekly. Make sure you join us on February 13th with Sri Sundarlingam. That's right. He's the Vice President of Product and Solutions Marketing at Extra Hop. Uh, we're going to discuss how do you actually capture packets in your cloud uh, applications and cloud systems. You may have that nailed down in your network, maybe you don't, right? But when you get to the cloud, it's a really important thing for you to consider um, as you look at all of the potential data sources for your indicators of compromise. Uh, of course, the network does not lie. You can register for the upcoming webcast at securityweekly.com and uh, it's free. All you can do is go to register and you can learn how to capture packets in the cloud. Uh, Peter Smith is the founder of Edgewise and CEO, a serial entrepreneur, um, one of our more technical CEO and founders, which I love, uh, and is here today to talk about detecting Python backdoors. Oh, yeah. We're which it turns fun. out is pretty a pretty popular thing. Especially when your code's written in Python, like ours. <laughs> Right. Well, I, well, it's cross-platform. I mean, we've seen yeah. uh, instances on, on Windows, of course, on Linux. Right, as basically a kind of like a Java write once run anywhere kind of thing. Right. You got a Python. Yeah, that's interpret. exactly. Well, yeah, and yeah. you and I were talking about this, Peter. You know, as much as we go in, in some of my research, right, is how to slim down my containers, reduce the attack surface. I'm like, I really want to remove utilities like wget and curl. Um, and Git, right? Because I need some of those to build my container, but then I can remove them, right? And I'm like, oh, that's really cool. But then uh, Peter and I talk, I'm like, but one of my containers has PHP on it. So like all, like basically you could recreate those utilities in a few lines of, especially wget and curl in a few lines of PHP. It lets me run commands or code. Yeah. Same thing, right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, I, I think there's somewhat of a misconception that a container only runs the application that it was wrapped around, and the reality is it can run any piece of software, uh, anything that you could download uh, from the internet uh, once you gain a foothold in the container or anything that's existing in the container. And certainly to your point, um, if your application is uh, Python, you've got interactive Python, you can do quite literally anything that you can copy and paste. And it's interesting, not just Python applications include Python in the container. A lot of other applications need a Python library or the Python interpreter to do something else so that may be in your application container. T totally. I, the way I characterize Python is it's the PowerShell of the Linux and Unix world. It's completely it's per per pervasive. It's on, uh, for, for that matter, it's on every one of your laptops, mm -hmm. right? By mm -hmm. default, it's on every Linux distribution, basically every Unix uh, operating system, uh, and it's even on Windows. Uh, what, what we're going to do today is it's, it's kind of fun. Um, I was I was looking at uh, Python backdoors. Uh, you're probably familiar with Empire, mm -hmm, uh, which mm -hmm. is a PowerShell uh, post post exploitation framework. But it's actually PowerShell and Python. Um, and so as I was looking into this, I found 230 Python-based backdoors on GitHub. Literally 230 of them. And that was just typing the word Python backdoor and looking through the list. And it's all sorts of projects that people were working on. And as I was looking at them, you know they. They were, you know, erring on the side of complexity, the ability to do remotely loaded modules, stuff like that. And I said, you know, to really understand how a backdoor works, you're not going to use one of these projects. They're mm -hmm. thousand plus lines of code. What is the simplest possible demonstration of a Python backdoor? And we got it down to uh, total lines of code, taking out any white uh, uh, new lines. 
um, including all of the headers and everything. So this is a pretty generous definition of the lines of code is 76 lines of code for a pre-execution sort of trick you into executing it, mm -hmm. a bootstrapper, command and control server, and the actual code that runs your commands. 76 lines of code. And this is applicable on Windows. Um, we were talking about Silent Trinity, right? Yeah, that's Which right. Which uses a, a .NET framework to load in other languages, that's right. such yeah, as yeah. Python. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You see, you see that with Java as well. Mm. Uh, there's, there's a lot of languages that you can... It's not cross-compilation. It's actually just uh, libraries that enable an interpreter or a execution framework to be able to run other languages. Mm -hmm. You see... Java being able to run Python, you see .NET being able to run Python. It's fairly common. So uh, really, when you get a foothold uh, in an environment, you can use most any runtime language to execute whatever code you happen to have. And some of the advantages of Python is it can evade certain host-based detections oh, or endpoint absolutely. security. Absolutely, yeah, right? yeah. That's why you would do that. Yeah, it's easy to obfuscate, and uh, frankly, it's so common. Uh, if you go onto any one of your Linux boxes and just do it's a there. PS, yeah. um, I guarantee you, you are going to see some process running in Python. Uh, it, even like the uh, the the stats uh, tool for for monitoring like disk activity and whatnot. Yeah. On a default installation, you go there, and sure enough, it's it's running as a as a uh, like a stats D Python executable. And I'll back up your story even more, Peter, because when people build containers, they often uh, and in images or pull images, right? Um, they will include the generic uh, disc or image for that application, right? So rather than pulling a base Linux distribution and purposely installing and configuring that container and ultimately the image, they will just pull something like Node 8 or whatever it is. And those images that are more application focused will include other libraries, mm -hmm. likely Python in there, in some part of the build stage or for some dependency, making your image much larger mm -hmm. uh, and giving the attackers a lot more surface to work with, uh, not realizing. So I did a, a mini study, right? And I pulled Node 8, and there was 23,000 vulnerabilities. I pulled Debian Slim, and there were 43 vulnerabilities, all of which were informational, right? So it's a big difference, and I think people rushing out to get their applications out will just choose whatever image is what they think is best suited for them, which often includes a lot more than what they need to run that container, often including things like Python. And of course, this this isn't exclusive to containerization. It's uh, pervasive in the EC2 world as well. Absolutely. Uh, you do a default installation of any Unix operating system, and it will have Python by default. Yeah, Amazon. Likely Linux Amazon's a, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, Amazon, yeah, Linux, yeah. Right. Amazon Linux <coughs> doesn't matter if it's one, two, mm -hmm. Ubuntu, CentOS, yeah. whatever you deploy, it has Python in it. And I think part of the uh, part of what I what I'm trying to show here is uh, this is really just educational. This isn't really to to demonstrate my product or my capabilities. It's really just to show and educate people about how much of a threat this actually is. You've got this universal platform that can be used and sort of uh, turned into a post-execution framework trivially. Mm -hmm. It's awesome. Uh, so. Uh, Iranian hackers are using yes, that's Python right. backdoors. Yeah, yeah. Not surprising. Uh, wh what you can see on the screen here, um, there are some fairly recent articles. I, I believe these were from a month, maybe two months ago. Uh, late 2019, anyhow. Uh, and so the, the Turkish government um, was under attack from uh, Iran. And there was a cybersecurity company that detected... Um, that maybe there was some strange backdoors happening. And when they looked into it, what they found was a bunch of Python-based backdoors. And uh, with further analysis, they found out that uh, there was a lot of code that was just copy and pasted from the internet with some glue and wrapper code to bring it all together to make, make this framework. And um, it didn't match any signatures. Uh, it was uh, difficult to detect. 
And, uh, you know, it really piqued my interest. I think one of the things I like doing on this show with you is, uh, you know, when there's a, a recent event like this, how can we recreate it, reconstruct right, the scenario so that we can actually decompose it? We obviously don't have access to the, to the actual Python backdoor code that, that was used in this attack, but we can certainly understand how easy it was to accomplish. Uh, and one of the first stages here is the exploitation stage. And I, I think one of the things that's really fascinating about what they did is they compromised the library distribution for the Python libraries uh, so that uh, by loading modules and stuff like that, you were actually loading the backdoor code. And so... Um, we could do like a whole oh, that, other that series. That is a whole different A whole role. other problem that I, I, I wish we had better solutions for. I think there are some theories that could solve that problem, but super hard in really any language, Python being kind of unfortunately the shining example of I'm including libraries in my project, I'm importing them, they're being downloaded from the internet, and those in fact are malicious. Yeah, you have to use TLS-based connections to make sure that you're legitimately connecting to the repository you think you're connecting to. You need to do package signing, you need to do SHA-256 verification and, and even of if every you do file. That, you could still you be could victim still of, that, oh, yeah. of that attack. Yeah, it's yeah, hard right. to keep track of all that stuff and do it accurately. Well, and it's changing so fast, because we're in an open source world, right? So you have all these open source libraries that are getting bundled into lots of other distros. Yep. And because of that, the whole supply chain uh, across the board is potentially poisoned somewhere along Could, the way. Couldn't agree more. The hierarchy of dependencies, uh, y you've all done uh, uh, some sort of yum install mm -hmm. of a Python project or something, and the list of dependencies is often massive. Uh, and I every one of those is an opportunity for something to go wrong, whether it's by compromising the GitHub repository that it was built from that ultimately goes through the, the package <coughs> management frameworks. Uh, there's just so many entry points and ability to, to compromise. The one that I was going to focus on today was uh, uh, sort of a, a watering hole attack, which is, I think, one of the more more fun uh, aspects. And and this one, I it doesn't need to be sophisticated. Like, you think about watering hole attacks, and if I compromise a site of a target uh, that I know that my target frequents, mm -hmm. then I could potentially inject some sort of malicious uh, code into that 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 page that gets loaded but it doesn't need to be that complicated it could be far simpler like think about how many times paul, paul let me ask you a question how many times have you copy and pasted code from the internet a lot yeah mm -hmm. yeah i mean like he programs lot. and stack overflow just like <laughs> yes, i do yes, yes. today <laughs> so, today paul today so let's let's do a lot. this well what's interesting is recently i'm <clears throat> realizing that there are some definite downsides to that right but even if you take that into account, to go back to your dependency problem, when I'm now building containers and, and publishing images to my own repositories, I will install utilities to build my container, and then I will try and remove them to clean up after myself. But here's what you run into. I may install a curl library to install the curl binary. Yep. I will pull down code from the internet. I will check it, make sure it's valid and validate the hashes. Then I'll go remove curl from my package manager. However, if I clean up after myself and remove that curl library, what if my application installs something like PHP curl, which I need from my application, that also relied on that library? Now PHP curl is broken, and I have to put that libcurl library back, and what if that's the one that is in fact compromised. So the dependency issue is not straightforward in any way, shape, no, or form. No, not at all. Uh, I, I think your example of curl is a great one. I, I was just trying to find uh, the research from CrowdStrike that uh, listed the top 10 um, administrative tools that are used for abuse. Mm -hmm. Things that you would expect like PSXEC, um, stuff like that. Uh, Wget, curl, all of those, uh, those are just seemingly benign administrative tools but they are they are the workhorses of lateral movement because yes. they're available mm -hmm. like it, it's no different not and to they have vulnerabilities by the way i will build brand new images and do my due diligence of trying to remove vulnerabilities i upload it to amazon's ecr and amazon goes yeah by the way you also have a vulnerability in your curl library i'm like yeah. ah yeah. Like yeah, i can't, can't win, win. <laughs> the uh, the the most popular camera is the iphone or the mobile phone it's it's the camera you have with you when you want to take a picture 
Well, it's no surprise that the most popular tools for lateral movement are the ones that are most you. commonly pre-installed on yes. the operating system. They're right. the administrative tools. So mm -hmm. uh, it seems uh, harmless to just include some mm -hmm. curl, but at the end of the day, that's a big problem. Um, so uh, watering hole attacks. Yes. They're, they're fun. So l let's just go through this thought experiment. Um, you are using Stack Overflow to do some sort of programming task, and, and you're asking a question. Now, I want to target you, and I, I know based on a history of questions you've asked that your username is such and such, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Paul Security Weekly. And so I wait for you to ask a question, and um, I respond to that with something that looks completely benign, and it might actually accomplish what you asked to have done, but it also what does something else. What else does it do, Paul? <laughs> That's so evil. I love it's it. It's so evil. I love it. That's but, your, you've but, got your evil hat. As Mike oh, po, it's a yes. Mike Poor reference, right? Yeah. You've got your right. evil hat on. Very I, well done. No. So, so let's, let's, uh, let's look at how this might play out. Um, if, you, if you can see my screen, uh, one yeah. of the things that we often do, and I, I absolutely despise this uh, tactic. Uh, I hate to pick on homebrew here, but um, they're doing it, so I'm going to use it as an example. Uh, you see this? Install homebrew. Just <laughs> copy and paste this, this random Ruby script that does something, because all it's doing is downloading the script from their website and simply executing it. That could literally be anything. anything right. And people are doing this. Mm -hmm. I, I've seen this in all manner of startups to try to take the friction out of the adoption process for their customers, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but without recognizing just how massive a security hole this is. So let's go back to the whole Stack Overflow uh, idea. And uh, Homebrew installs uh, open it's source. It's a package manager. For, for It's an open source package manager for, for Mac OS. For Mac OS, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, but, yeah. But, but Peter, it's okay. It's not using sudo. Yeah, yeah right. Exactly. <laughs> uh, so until like three minutes later, it asks you for your password. Yeah, you know. You know. It, that's okay. Sorry, it's potentially. It's it's good. Potentially. It's all good. It's all good. So, so let's say I was targeting targeting you, and I, I had a question, uh, or you had a question, rather, which was, how do I install pip on, uh, on Python 3 on Linux systems? So I'm going to go to Google, and I'm going to ask this. So uh, install pip uh, Python 3 Linux. Sudo apt-get install pip3. And... <laughs> So I'm gonna. There's this Stack Overflow article right here. How to install pip with Python 3. I click it, and I'm looking at the answer, and I see it. Oh, there's some code. Good, good God, no! There's some code <laughs> to copy and paste here. Curl dash ks. Go to update python dot us preloader to sh right shell, um, which looks harmless. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm gonna copy it, and I'm gonna paste it over here. Well, before I do that, I'm really scared now. Um, <laughs> I'm really, I'm before, really, truly scared. Before I do that, you, you have a good EDR on there. <laughs> <laughs> but Wait, so, are you connected to our network? <laughs> before I go down this path, uh, I should actually show you what it's going to do um, and turn it on. Uh, Which you, I, it, arguably, Peter, it's a great point. You should do that before you execute this script, right? If you are if you've got your tinfoil hat on, right, you're going to go download this script, even give it a cursory review to be like, what code is executing on my system? But most people don't. They're in a hurry. They have a deadline. I need PIP3. Got to get these Python libraries installed so I can push out my next revision of my Python app. Not, not to mention, even basic obfuscation and the person that does the cursory look over that script throws their hand up and says, Eh, throw caution to the right. wind. Sure. Copy paste done. Right. Uh, so e even if I wanted to obfuscate it, sure. Base sixty four encode it so it's a blob, and the person's going to look at it, be like, eh, I don't know what it does. Keep going. Keep going. Um, yep. You just need to put small amounts of friction in place, right. and people will say, I need to well, meet I, my I, deadline. I need to. I need yep. to move forward. Mm -hmm. um, so what we're going to do here um, is we're going to build a Python based backdoor. So I'm going to skip through all this stuff. Uh, and there's, there's really, when you look at the anatomy of a backdoor, you've got a preloader. It's the first thing that you execute locally. In this case, it's that preloader thing that we're going to get off of Stack Overflow.
Um, that then gets a bootstrapper, which is responsible for establishing persistence and connecting up to uh, uh, connecting up to the command and control system. Uh, persistence itself is a separate topic. Like, how do you leverage things like the cron tab of the local uh, uh, user to make it so that even if you noticed a funny process running and you mm -hmm. killed it, it would go away, and then well, I don't know, five minutes later, it would come, come back. back. Um, and then the command and control system itself, how do you dispatch commands to it, receive the commands, execute them, and really what can you do with a command and control system? It's, it's really easy for security people to say, oh, you can do anything with a command and control system. But that, that's, a, that's a cheap explanation of really understanding what the true uh, uh, potential is. Um, can you install packages? Can you uh, scan a network? Like, what can you do with a command and control system? So I, it's kind of fun to dissect this stuff and build it from the ground up to get a real appreciation for what these systems are and what they're capable of. It, it, it's interesting. We did uh, an interview with another sponsor, Scythe, right? That <coughs> in like a cursory mention, Bryson was like, yeah, by the way, our steganography command and control system has never been detected. And they kind of like moved on. But you step back and think about that, build a proof of concept for a command and control system. Yeah, largely, you could probably detect that. Mm -hmm. But the folks that have the motivation to build command and control systems that are purposely made to evade detection, mm -hmm. those are the ones that are scary and can be loaded through your pre-bootloader. Totally, your right? totally agree. Um, the goal of this effort was to be understandable, be educational, and yet in 76 lines, right. it's fully TLS encrypted. It's obfuscated inside the TLS tunnel, uh, just with some basic encoding techniques, but <coughs> the point is I am not just sending plain text across the wire. It's encrypted, and what's inside the encrypted tunnel is obfuscated, uh, and, and right. that is 76 lines of Python. If I actually tried, tried or a right. malicious actor actually tried, uh, oh yeah, you could you could build something that, that would evade detection. Suffice it to say, mm -hmm. your 76 lines of Python would likely evade most detection Systems For a pretty long there. period of time in most yeah, networks I, today. Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah. There are some techniques that I've been toying with just to just because it would be fun. Uh, like, for instance, um, if you want the process in the process table to show up different than, uh, you know, sort of revealing its intent, um, you, can <coughs> you can simply echo a Base64 blob in and pipe it into the Python command, which all the Python arguments that you would see in PS is decoding and executing the Python script. So what's actually running inside the Python process is completely unknown to the attacker unless they see and correlate the fact that there was an echo with a base64 blob that's that's no longer running that was piped into that python script so you would absolutely need edr to track all of the process invocations understand that that socket that piped through uh, was actually a base64 blob which you then de uh, deconstructed to figure out what that unrelated Python script or, or process was doing. So you can put enough layers of indirection in there mm -hmm. that um, you would need to put effort into figuring out what was going on. And I think that's really the point. The point isn't to no, it completely is. avoid detection. <coughs> right. It's to make it so that you have to want to. It, it's, it's not a, obvious. It's a great point. We've talked about that. Like, how do you know when you see the anomalous behavior in your network, what is pretty much like off the shelf malware that's easy to automate a process to identify and eradicate and automate the incident response versus what is something that I need to look deeper into, mm -hmm. right? And as the attackers kind of morph their techniques, those lines become blurred, right? Mm -hmm. Is it noise? Is it something I can ignore? Or is it something I need to do full blown yeah. Forensics on, and, and part part of the strategy there, you you probably noticed that in that Stack Overflow, the thing I copied and pasted, it, it was a uh, uh, update Python.us. Part of it is, in a way, social manipulation. Right. It's it's sounds using legit. Using things that yeah. sound yeah benign that sure you would look at and say, yeah, that prob that probably does what it's supposed to do. Moving on with my day. Uh, and certainly, if you made it's it, it's not so a dot ru domain, so I'm good. Yeah, right, right, right yeah, <laughs> yeah. Only, only safe people register dot us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, this isn't that the whole deal with with lying in wait for Paul is you're 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 going to social engineer him to get him to click the link that you're providing, irrespective of what it does. 
Yeah, yeah, precisely. And, and the uh, more benign looking, the better, right? No question. And if you can make the thing that is being copy and pasted do what you originally claimed it would do, actually make it a right. helpful utility right. with a little bit of extra a little extra. Yeah. <laughs> and, but you know what's interesting about that is when Larry and I wrote the book on WRT54G routers, right, we theorized that you could create malicious firmware that emulated the full behavior of what you would interface with in your home router, but there was malicious code built into it. The user would have no idea, like, oh, I downloaded this firmware, I installed it, it I, I can get to the internet, my firmware is up to date, it tells me I'm up to date, but inside of it is a process that's redirecting my DNS and sniffing all of my packets and redirecting certain connections to my banks, to, to other uh, systems the attacker controls, right? Very similar scenario. Ex exactly. So you want to oh. see what, the, uh, what this thing does? Oh, believe me, I do. <laughs> okay, so uh, we'll start just by uh, bringing the command and control system on and going to Stack Overflow and doing our copy and paste. And just sort of moving on with our day, then we'll start to deconstruct it and see really what is it doing behind the scenes. And, you know, uh, I think it, it bears repeating. Th this really is just for educational purposes. Like, wait, you should, no, you should do you, do you own like this, this Python update.us? Is this your attack? Or yeah, this, I, I wrote all of this. Um, uh, so I originally did this for a webinar and I was going to do some like simple stuff. And I was like, you know, this, this would be far more interesting if we actually built something useful. Uh, so pull this together and uh, yeah, this is start to finish uh, a full command and control system, 76 lines of Python. Wow. it's awesome. So uh, let's get into it. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to start the command and control system. Um, and I'm going to copy and paste that. Uh, oh, excuse me. Sorry about that. So I went to um, uh, Stack Overflow. I copied this. It looked fine. Update Python.us preloader piped into SH. As we saw in Homebrew, uh, I, I'm being trained by vendors to not think that this is something that I should scrutinize because, you know, everybody does it. So it must be good. So I just run this guy. <coughs> and you know, maybe it, maybe it did what it was supposed to do, maybe it didn't. Um, but if we, if we look at this um, and look for, for Python here, <clears throat> you can see that it's loaded this Python script and it's running in the background. Uh, we'll get into what it's actually doing momentarily. Uh, and persistence, part of what that preloader did when it loaded the bootstrapping code, the bootstrapper came down from the, uh, the command and control system and the first thing it did was establish persistence. And the way it did that was um, <clears throat> it just put a cron tab entry in, which literally just runs the thing that yeah. I copy and pasted mm -hmm. every minute. And the preloader has some logic in it to say, you know, if you're already running, then don't run again. Just drop the process. So if I were to go in there and I were to, to, to kill that process, um, it would just come back in a minute. So um, what is this actually doing under the covers? Uh, it, it is worth noting that the re reason you separate a preloader from a bootstrapper is because um, if you have a preloader that is simple and dumb, the only thing it does is downloads the bootstrapper from the command and control system, what that means is that you can upgrade yourself. Mm -hmm. Every time the preloader executes from the cron tab or it's copy and pasted, you are getting the latest and greatest of the... Uh, client software for the command and control system. So mm -hmm. it's almost like it's a self-updating system. If I'm on the command and control system and modify that code, every one of my controlled systems will be updated the next time it kicks off the, pre, uh, the preloader. Hey, so, I'm just, you know, phoning home. It's totally fine. Yeah, it's all fine. Until so, next week where it downloads code that takes out your entire power grid, right? Yeah. No, 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 <laughs> seriously. Uh, so there's a couple interesting things we do here. I, I narrow, so this whole idea of phoning home. Uh, right now I have it set to do a randomized interval between one and three seconds, but uh, typically I think tech, techniques that are used is to randomize the phone home interval mm -hmm. to be between uh, you know one second and five hours or five days so that when you're looking at network graphs mm -hmm. you don't see the periodicity of 
a connection that's like every single time it connects. Because those are sorts of uh, very obvious indicators mm -hmm. of some sort of routine repetitious action. So the, you deliberately it, it requires, randomize it. But it requires that you look a little harder, right? It Not just interval, but it requires you look at other factors in that this size, roughly this size packet going to this external IP address mm -hmm. Maybe at random intervals is roughly the same. That's true. But you have to really be yep. even in like active countermeasures product. That, I was that just does say, this, look right? at, looking at looking yeah. at what the average jitter is of you that. still yeah. you still have to be really aware that this technology exists and be looking you, for you're it. Right. You you can look for it, right? But you gotta think about it from well, a different perspective, right? I, I toyed around with I just didn't want to put the time into it. I, I toyed around with the idea of having a list of domains and each of those was actually resolving to multiple addresses so that there was much more randomization so that it was a random one to say five hour interval you know and every time it was going to a different you know what's really evil control. though that i just thought about if you were to randomize both the number of packets and the size of packets that would make it so hard to detect it, it would be very really difficult. hard yeah. over the network oh. certainly and, and and if you also if you were to say obfuscated by using things that look like normal activities, making it look like it's some sort of Google search or something that like you would get a lot of anyway. That is awesome. Uh, w <laughs> one of the things that I was planning to do, I just never really got around to it, is, um, and it's so simple, is whenever a command is sent or received or the results are sent back to the command and control system, randomly look up a random word from the dictionary on Google take the content and embed the payload in right. it yeah. just to obfuscate it so that right. you have a random set of data uh -huh. from a v valid source and the content is always embedded in it. Uh, that would have oh, added a couple oh, oh, more oh. lines of code. Um, so <laughs> I, it, I, if, I didn't go down that road. If you're an attacker, close your ears right now. So, <laughs> so, uh, so let's, look, let's look at this thing. Define attacker or red teamer. Right. So if Good we point. look at the preloader, this is the benign uh, thing that you're going to you're going to copy and paste uh, downloaded via curl like we did. Uh, let's, let's look at what it does. Um, super simple here. The first thing is really we just check to make sure the bootstrapper uh, is or is not running so that we don't get a bunch of duplicate processes. <laughs> and then we do the exact same thing we, for crontab. We say, well, is crontab already updated for persistence? If it is, then leave it alone. If it isn't, then put it back in. So you have to remove this thing in exactly the right order. You have to kill the Python process. You need to remove the from cron the crontab tab. Yep. and make sure that you do that within the right interval of time. Otherwise, it'll just put itself back into cron tab mm -hmm. and keep going. Uh, and then we execute the bootstrap code. And really, all this is, it's, it's quite literally one line, uh, this one Python line right here, which is saying, uh, get the URL lib from and, and the requests uh, library for Python and just go to updatepython.us and get the bootstrapper and execute it. That's all it's doing. This, this really couldn't be simpler. And then this is one last interesting point. Um, on Mac OS, persistence is a little bit different. Mac OS has a framework for authorization of any modifications of privileged files. Crontab is considered a privileged file. And what it does is if you go and you do, uh, um, let's just do it actually. If I were to go into my desktop right here, and I said, uh, sorry, get rid of the toolbar there, um, crontab-e, uh, crontab-e, and I was just to add something and do that. See how it prompted me? Mm. So I click OK, and now that's modified. So the user will get a prompt whenever I try to establish persistence. But with this little block of code, what it does is it looks at uname-a to see if it's Mac OS. And if it is, it puts a randomized time in. And the whole point is to disassociate the action of executing the bootstrapper or the, uh, the preloader from when you get prompted. So imagine this is 10 minutes later. Uh, you execute your bootstrapper. 10 minutes later, you get this random prompt that says, hey, terminal needs some access. You're like, uh. Oh, okay, whatever. Click OK and you move on with your day. That's awesome. You want to separate the time mm -hmm. from when you do the actual installation from when it prompts you for privilege. That's exactly what that line of code does. That's mm -hmm. awesome. So all this is about is giving you a nice tight shell script that you can copy paste the URL 
and it launches your effectively command and control client. So what does the command and control client does do? Um, if I go to, I'll do it in VI actually. So there's a bunch of boilerplate. The boilerplate is included in the 76 lines of code. Um, this is the entire control script. It's a simple while loop. And all we do is we go and we get the commands from the control server that's registered to the host name. So we key off of the host name of the device. We go to the command and control system and we say, I'm checking in. Here's the timestamp of when I checked in and my host name. And then it says, by the way, do you have any commands you want me to execute? It goes and executes them. And then once it's done with that, it says, oh, I've got a response I need to post to the command and control system. So it puts the command or the response into the command and control system so that the attacker so can, wait yeah it please runs a command and posts the response yeah, via the, json the, in the that output. one line of python yeah exactly uh so really the idea here is that let's say i told it to do an end map it would execute the end map and then it would wait for the process to finish it would get the results of the end map and it would put it up into the command and control system so that as the attacker, I go and I say, okay, show me uh, all of the commands and results for the host lin user db01. Uh, if the command is executing, it shows you the command that's executing. If the command has completed executing, it shows you the results of the command invocation. And it JSONifies that on the fly. It just, it, it actually doesn't use JSON in this case. Um, uh, the JSON here, it, is uh, for the structure of the command and control. Mm -hmm. uh, it uses base64 for posting it. So it's mm -hmm. wrapped inside a TLS connection. Uh, and then inside that is all base64 encoded uh, values. Your end map results are base64 yep. encoded yep. inside your TLS. Yeah, yeah exactly. And I, the only reason I did that is because um, I wanted to show that uh, it's easy to obfuscate results uh, inside the TLS tunnel. Base64 isn't particularly <laughs> sophisticated or novel, but it was literally just like you typed in encode.base64 and you were done. You could certainly be, uh, encode it in any other scheme that you felt was reasonable. It reminds me of like snort rules back in the day that looked for commands or results of commands that were running like ID on a system, mm -hmm. right? But simply base64 encoding them could conceivably obfuscate yeah th there are frameworks that can certainly iterate through encoding schemes sure uh, if you used yeah. a novel encoding scheme that it couldn't uh, decode uh, it, it might raise it as suspicious right uh, or it might just move on with its day um, there, there are other ways of handling this you could uh, you could encode it inside a JPEG image and encode the JPEG image in a base 64 encoding which is a typical mime based transmission for a JPEG image if you look in mm -hmm. HTML document, oftentimes you'll see embedded blobs of Base64, which are actually just JPEGs mm -hmm. or other document structures. Um, so it, it's just a really simple way of doing this. This last line here. Um, we're, we're glad you're on the good side and not the <laughs> evil side, Peter. Uh, this oh, last no, line here oh. is the randomization. Uh, please, sorry, I'm, I interrupted you. I was just thinking if, you, if it looked like it was rendering a JPEG and you, if you could cause make a copy of python that was called preview or some other image viewer holy crap oh there there is so much potential here it's mm -hmm. it's it's really crazy uh so this last line here is the randomization uh if you don't want there to be a very consistent uh periodic connection that you see um in here just because it's for demo purposes i bound it between one and three seconds but in a real world scenario where uh latency isn't as much of a consideration this might be between five uh between let's say uh 512 seconds and uh you know uh, a, 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 a thousand seconds or 20,000 seconds so that yeah. you can shift uh, uh uh sort of the intervals of connection so it doesn't make a very clear pattern so Sh shifting time the number of packets the size of the packets makes it Exactly. E each stage makes it more difficult to detect. It's sure. it's no different than what we were talking about previously, where um, uh, e trying to separate the time from when you execute something to when it prompts you for the access, like on Mac OS right. for CronTab. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the last part of this, you've got the preloader, 
Uh, you've got the bootstrapper. These things establish persistence. Uh, and then they communicate to the control system to post uh, results and receive commands for execution is the controller itself. And this, again, <coughs> is just so, so simple to do these things. This is a, a simple Flask app. Uh, and again, all of those headers, that's all included in the 76 lines of code. So uh, all we're doing here is setting up some simple variables. Um, you've got a target, which is the host name of the object that's connecting in. You've got a command that it's supposed to execute and a response that it gives after executing the command. That's it. That's all that's going on here. And then a simple little loop that says, um, uh, if you've got an update, put it in the status. Uh, it, uh, I'm sorry, if you don't have anything, just give me a status, which is a timestamp, so that you can see the last time something checked in. Uh, if you've got a response, put the response into the response object. If you've got a command, put the command into the command object. And if you put nothing in, just provide the response or the command. Mm -hmm. it, it, I mean, it's a simple input-output framework. This is, uh, I think the last time I counted this, this is like 12 lines of code for a full command and control this server. This is on your server side, yeah. collecting yeah. your responses. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And doing HTTPS was just like a configuration oh. parameter. There was, there was no real programming involved in doing that. So this idea that um, you know, uh, uh, threats can't use TLS effortlessly, it is absolutely effortless. Effortless. That's a, that's a great so, usage yeah. of uh, Flask. So let's see. I like <laughs> yes, it. I like yeah. it. Uh, so let's see. If we do um, run this thing, uh, we've got our command and control running on Linap Pay01, the payment processing system. Uh, we've got a user's database server over here, which we can um, get going. And we should start seeing um, two things user db01 and Linap Pay01. Now, uh, this starts getting interesting because if I go over here to this Windows box and I run the exact same thing, uh, now it won't work on Windows. Now we'll see ADO2 coming in. This is the Active Directory Domain Controller. So this is the same code running on uh, Ubuntu, CentOS, and uh, and and Windows. Now the question is, what if uh, I did this on my Mac? What would it do? Um, so let me. Um, actually just clean up my my mess here um sorry give me one more second and it's going to prompt me okay so um i'm going to paste the uh the line from stack overflow here and if you want to talk about how we got that into Stack Overflow, it's it's not malicious even a little bit. Um, I just did that for the the storyline, but it's still uh, interesting. I'm intrigued. As yeah. So uh, we're going to run this on Mac OS now. So we've got Ubuntu, CentOS, Active Directory, uh, Windows Box, and now this is uh, Mac OS. Um, and and no, if I had, uh, what I should have done is backgrounded this, um, and maybe I'll do that actually. Um, I'll background it to make the point. So this goes and it runs. OK, great. It did something. Didn't prompt me for anything. I'm feeling pretty good about what's going on. A minute goes by, and all of a sudden, I'm going to get, hopefully I didn't put it to a minute, because that would be an <laughs> awfully long time for a live demonstration. Um, <laughs> we a lot of air. Some, <laughs> yeah, that's fill. a lot of air time. Uh, well, at some point, what it's going to do is it's going to prompt me for the approval to modify. That's what that entire code was about shifting the time. Uh, it still hasn't prompted me, but it's, it's, it's doing what it's supposed to do. Um, it's thinking about it. Uh, in so, the background. So tell the rest of the pot Stack Overflow story while we're waiting. And you can, you can see uh, there's the Mac machine. So it's running, but and it's now, doing what it's supposed to do. That's just spitting it out to the screen, Peter. You could very easily write that to a database on your server side via uh, Flask. Oh, easily, yeah. yeah. If you wanted persistence on the command and control system, you could. I just did it in memory because um, it, it suited my purposes for demonstration. Um, so yeah, yeah, the uh, <laughs> getting it on Stack Overflow, it's it's nothing fancy. Um, the I I was going to originally uh, I was going to post a question on Stack Overflow and then with a separate account answer the question with that uh, string value, uh, but it was requiring things like uh, Facebook to log in and I. 
long since deleted my Facebook account. And so I, uh, I, I, I didn't want to make all of these things just for demonstration. So I found this little plugin that uh, does string replacement on any uh, web page. So if you find a string, it'll replace it with whatever other string you put in. So I just have it do this uh, string replacement. So you can see uh -huh. my, my, uh, my preloader that's embedded in the page. It's a, it's a real page. It's loading from a Stack Overflow. But it's just a, a trick of the, the browser. Uh, just so you don't oh. think I was doing something so uh, malicious, uh, which I was not. Smoke and mirrors. Ah. Yeah, that, that, that part was smoke and mirrors, because I wasn't going to go and mess around with Stack Overflow. So I thought that, I was, love it. that yeah, was kind of I mean, crossing was no the line, sorry, I, there was I think. There no evil intent in my comment. I think that's really cool. Yeah, no, but that doesn't exist on Stack Overflow, no, if you, just no, in your browser. Yeah, if you yeah. went to that web page right now, it would show you the actual real thing. I, I felt like... Uh, trying to to post a comment to that thread that mm -hmm. had the malicious stuff, it was, it it was, it, it was just over the line. Yeah, that, that's what I was yeah. hinting towards before. Yeah, I'm yeah. glad yeah. you clarified that. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> um, that's a great little. Like you're like a magician, Peter. <laughs> well, I, you know, I, it, it's storytelling, so I wanted it to awesome. to make make sense and and whatnot. And it's it. perfectly plausible that somebody would do that to Agreed. another person Agreed. on Stack Overflow. Right. Um, so what can you do with this thing? Uh, that's that's where it kind of gets fun. Uh, so if we go to the command and control system, the nice thing is this has a, a web interface, right, for the attacker to it's to, to use. Yeah, it's just a it's just a web page. In this case, uh, we're just manipulating the system using um, URL uh, gets, mm -hmm. and it prints out a uh, JSON blob, which I have pretty printed yep. in the in the screen here. So um, I believe I've got the command and control system running. That's great. We come over here, and the first thing you do, if you don't provide any parameters, um, I am using an unsigned insert because I'm lazy, uh, <coughs> it gives you an enumeration of all of the objects that are presently registered and the last time they checked in. So if you want to check on a specific system, let's say we wanted to go to linuserdb01. You know what's awesome? I, developing a, a Python Flask application like I have, I was like, this is perfect for developing a command and control system. It, it's just so simple. It's right. it's it, it's really amazing like, actually. <laughs> we were talking about in our meeting today, Matt, right? Like modern applications have to handle multi-user environments and do the whole HTML uh, 5 thing where they you know, multiple people modifying the same right. documents Contr and things yeah, like that. The, the whole CRUD operation, right? And how you do it. But in Flask, it's just post requests and webhooks yeah. and totally applicable to that yeah. to create this type of system where I'm an attacker I log in it's a very it's single user system single here's user, everything right. I can get it I don't have to yeah. worry about multi user I don't have to worry about um, crud c conflicts with multiple it's just a single user it's app. a great command and control framework it, it, it is it is yeah. it's simplicity not, is, not the first time you've so used great. flask to highlight basically I got to say framework. it's kind of my go to just yeah. because it you know, I, I'm CEO of company. I, this isn't really what I do on a full-time basis. So it's like such a simple way of driving to right. the point. Um, it's sort of like Ruby on Rails, except without all of the, um, uh, the framing uh, mm -hmm. that, that you're, that's associated with that. S lots of little files. You can have everything self-contained in a single file, and it's just easy to understand, and it gets rid of all of the unnecessary garbage of uh, building an application. Like a real application. Yeah, yeah, no. It's, Very it's telling for cool. the application we're running today. Even, yes, Jan is. even Django, right, is more, I think, centered towards a multi-user kind of application. Flask is like, I'm the sole user. I, I want to have access to like all the data. data I modify yeah. all the data. I yep. insert all the data back in the database. Mm -hmm. Yep. Super easy. So uh, we can take this one more level deeper and say, well, I really want to know about linuserdb01. So we just put that into the URL. It tells me the status. But what is really interesting is when you start asking it to do commands. So I'm going to do um, nmap, or uh, better yet, I'm going to. Uh, I, I know that this system doesn't have nmap. Let's just prove that quickly. Uh, so we're on linuserdb01, and I do nmap. Oh, I guess I ran on nmap. Uh, so I'm going to have to remove that. Uh, great. That was easy. nmap, not there. Uh, so if I'm an attacker and I run an nmap command, which I'm not going to do because uh, you already know it's not there, um, I want to get nmap on the system. Um, well, 
you know, sudo is something that you should tightly control. There's no question about it. You, uh, you should not give that privilege out uh, willy-nilly. Unfortunately, in a lot of organizations, um, it is not well managed. Mm -hmm. And so uh, with, with sudo access, you could just as easily say sudo yum install dash y. That's important because what that means is I want non-interactive installation. So do a dash y install nmap. And uh, now you can see that the command is registered for the system to receive. We've got a variability of between one and three seconds. So within the next three seconds plus execution time, uh, Nmap will now be installed on this system. So the way we know that is if we get rid of the command here and we just say, show me your status, it says loaded plugins, latest version, already installed or latest version, nothing to do. Um, so. Uh, what we can do now is let's just verify that this is actually the case. Uh, if we come over here and we do, sorry, that tool, toolbar keeps popping up. That's annoying. So Nmap is now installed. So the attacker can uh, use Nmap to, uh, let's say, <coughs> I wanted to do command equals uh, Nmap. Um, sorry. So wait, Peter, the client is constantly making requests yeah. to your Flash yes. server. Yeah. What you did is change what it should execute when yeah, it checks exactly in. when right. i did command equals all i did was said hey do a sudo yum dash y install and map the next time it checks in. the next, next time, time it checks in, in it grabs it executes it mm -hmm. and then posts the response of that execution right. gotcha. and it said done so then i went back to the terminal just to show that it had actually been done now that i've got these this tooling at my disposal i can say nmap and i want to do an nmap on the loopback interface right. the next time it checks in execute that and command. this execute is that this command. is what it shows you it shows you all of the uh, awesome. open ports open that are ports on this on lo the box. local system so the the point is that um, it's easy and, frankly, a little bit lazy to say that, oh, command and control systems, you can do anything with them. Yes, that's true. You can do anything with them. Uh, what, what does anything mean? It means install quite literally anything, right? anything an administrator could do. I could install software. If, if I didn't have curl and I wanted curl, I could install, install curl. curl. Uh, if I wanted to put some other malicious payload, let's say I didn't have Mimi Cats oh. on ADO2, no, drop Mimi Cats down. But what's better yet, you can install curl. Do what you want with it, and then, and then remove, remove it. it. That's right. brilliant. I hadn't considered that. Yeah, I that's love a great it. So you can point. cover your own tracks. Yeah, right. You can install curl. Do whatever you need with curl. Just and then run another command to remove curl. It's off the box. And, yeah. beca and, and because the, com the commands yourself. aren't running, you now need to go back to command history or have this thing that might be able to detect. But that just like in containers, right? Yeah. Install curl. Do my thing. Mm -hmm. then, remove then remove curl. It. But a backdoor can do the same thing. Can do the yeah. exact same thing. So not only can you execute things, run a bunch of stuff. You can actually remove a bunch of the stuff to hide your tracks at the same time. In 76 lines of Python. That's awesome. So um, I, I think that... And, and it is an interactive system. See, as, as the attacker running what you've just shown us, you're literally, you're, you're just, you're, you're getting the data and then you're going, okay, well, I know that port's open. Now I want to launch something to see if I can go connect to something else, right? But each of those steps, you can also do some cover up and kind of back yourself back out of the system. Yeah, now like you got your another tracks system. as you go. Uh, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it, this isn't, uh, I mean, this isn't it's novel in any way, but it's, it's that, there are so many of these frameworks, post-execution uh, exploitation frameworks available, um, and really understanding their capabilities, even at this most basic level, and all of those systems that we were talking about, all 230 of them that you could find on GitHub or, or Empire or any of those, the level of sophistication of those is mind-boggling. The modularization of the, uh, the exploits and, and the scanning capabilities and, and all of that, it's all just loadable modules that it downloads from the command and control system. It's, it's really but pretty, pretty breathtaking what when, I love when is you consider it. No vulnerabilities or exploits needed. Yeah, a little social trick of yep. uh, you know a, t a targeted attack or a mm -hmm. social manipulation for a copy and paste, but certainly there's no reason that you couldn't take advantage of one of the multitude of like RDP exploits that's that's come available right. in the mm -hmm. past like nine months uh, for something that requires no so social manipulation. So how do you prevent and or detect and then prevent this or, yeah, so or vice versa? How do you prevent against it in the first place? I, I, I think, um, I think 
EDR is a, a obviously a very important part of this. When you're dealing with backdoors, having a running history of all of the command invocations, yeah. and exactly what Agreed. those what those uh, uh, you know uh, attacks were were doing. Arguably too late. It, yeah, potentially. True. Right? Yeah, and to be clear, Edgewise is all about prevention. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I I think I would. Uh, uh, do a disservice to the community if I said anything but that EDR is a necessity to understand what happened after the fact. But right, because um, as we said, these attacks can be morphed and changed, and no, no question, the, the whole thing. Right? <clears throat> yeah, uh, it's it's easy to evade the positive identification of malicious activity. Um, so uh, NGFW is a great example. It's it's looking at layer seven communications and for known signatures of malicious activity, uh, basic obfuscation techniques can uh, sidestep that. Mm -hmm. um, that's why you need EDR. But I, I think really um, uh, what, what I'm evangelizing here is that there are preventative solutions that are not susceptible to those sorts of basic obfuscation techniques. And what it requires you to understand is what's on either side of the network network connection, excuse me. Uh, the NGFW is concerned with what's happening on the network connection. How is this communicating? What is being communicated? And it has a, a, a dictionary, a library of known uh, signatures that indicate malicious activity. Um, but as you can see here, uh, it doesn't have a signature for my off-the-shelf uh, obfuscation techniques right. and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Um, so how do you really stop these things? And I'm a, a very strong believer in zero trust. Uh, and really the, the course concept for anybody that's not familiar is um, instead of positive identification of uh, known malicious activity or malicious software, it's actually about identifying what is known to be acceptable within your environment so that you can exclude all other potentially malicious things now and in the future. Um, and that's exactly what Edgewise does. We use the software identity and the machine identity uh, to say that um, what is acceptable communication is that uh, a specific business application, foo.jar, is allowed to talk to MySQLD, and we will authorize that connection based on the cryptographic identity of the communicating device and software to ensure that it is only the legitimate business applications that are communicating, thereby excluding this Python backdoor and everything else. Uh, and it gets down to a subprocess level uh, so that we can validate and authorize an individual Python script, not just python.exe, but the script itself mm. that's communicating. So we could say admin tool.py is allowed to do what it's supposed to do, mm -hmm. but everything else is excluded, meaning this Python based backdoor would not be allowed to communicate. Full stop while my administrative tools would continue functioning as if nothing had happened. So is Can that you creating a, a, a whitelist wow. around th what the application host communication is and saying, look, this is what it's allowed to communicate, therefore I'm going to block everything else. So in this particular but, case... But not the host, the application, right? The so software. It's yeah. like, software. like mm -hmm. the Java application spawns a Python. That Python, we know, connects to maybe an internal database. Mm -hmm maybe goes to some other external website during the update process to update. Outside of that, that Python script can connect to nothing else. Exactly. And, and it's and by, by application, exactly. not just application, but the script. Right. Of yeah, there's, Python's there's the application, the script admin.py, right, can connect to my internal database, can go update itself from this website. But if it goes to connect to you know, evilpeter.com, that's not a lot. And not if it's manipulated, the identity changes, and therefore it falls into the not allowed to have the access. Right. Uh, and there's really, uh, there's two layers of authorization. <laughs> and uh, while, while we don't often talk of it this way, um, I think for a security audience, it's a, 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 a a good way of thinking about it is um, it's like multi-factor authorization for things that can't reach into their pocket and pull a key fob out, that can't look up on Google Authenticator mm -hmm. in MFA code. Uh, we're using as the second factor the identity of the software and the identity of the device, verifying it on both sides of the network connection in real time, approximately five microseconds, to make sure that it's only the legitimate thing that's communicating. And we do that at the two layers of machine identity. That's the first step. Should these two devices 
devices even be allowed to communicate? Sure. And at the second layer, the software communicating between these two devices, should they be allowed to communicate? Because a lot of the zero trust solutions that are in the market really look at it just at the network layer, at the host layer. What you've added is an additional layer to say, it's not just the host, it's the host and the software, yep. and these are valid communication channels, these aren't, therefore block them, and that's the granularity. Machine that's the and software identity. Yeah. And I, I, I think, um, you know, a lot of organizations have latched on to this concept of zero trust, but I, I, I take offense to organizations that use address port and protocol and call themselves zero trust. And the mm -hmm. reason is because um, the concept of zero trust is uh, uh, to, to validate interactions with more authoritative <coughs> data, data that isn't uh, simply how two things are communicating. In address and a port and a protocol, that's how we're communicating. That's English, that's mm -hmm. Japanese, that's wh whatever language you're using. Uh, who is communicating is Paul talking to Peter. Authorizing that Paul is talking to, the P to Peter is like saying, uh, foo.py on host five, talking to MySQLD on host six. That's authenticating what is communicating, mm -hmm. not the language, not the address, not the port, not the protocol used to communicate. So I think, I think identity is intrinsic to zero trust. Mm -hmm. Oh, so, absolutely. So and I think that's where a lot of people get caught up in a lot of these zero trust solutions is they're only looking at that network protocol layer, but you brought in two interesting pieces, the application, the software, yeah. but then also the identity of the machine and that identity of how those correlate to that communication channel. And, and those are unique in that you have to understand what I call the triad in some respects. You're, you're pulling two pieces. It's the application and the user, the identity. Mm -hmm. I throw in the third piece is the data, but y y you've taken those two pieces and said, look, if I can't get a valid application identity match, I'm yep. not going to allow it. I exactly. But, we but we Peter, do a uh, device software container user. But okay. Peter, it sounds like you could <coughs> uh, potentially solve the library, malicious library problem mm -hmm. in that I have my Python applications running on a host, right? And in my Python application, I'm including a third party library. And all of a sudden, my Python application, as a result of importing that library, is trying to make a connection back to the attacker. Bingo. Y you would. It, like, that, that'll be that red is not, flags that all is over not the place. an authorized uh, pathway of communication for that software. Uh, so That's the really injection amazing. techniques yeah. that are common today would right. be ineffective. Um, th I think the the last major point to uh, to touch on here is. Um, the the benefit of identity um it's easy to chalk it up to a security benefit because you know we we're talking about security here and uh it's it's the most overt benefit of that capability um, but there is a massive operational benefit um so hear me out uh firewalls they derive their security benefit through specificity and granularity of their policies if it's not specific, if it's not targeted, they don't really do anything, right? Mm. So if I were to say, um, allow uh, slash 24 network range, port 443, to receive connections from slash 24 network range, and there was only three devices on each of those slash 24 networks that actually needed to communicate, that's overexposure. Mm. The lack of specificity overexposes the network's access. Mm -hmm. And the point is that the firewall needs to be articulate, as articulate and granular in its as definition possible. of pol policy right. as, pol as possible. Now, administrators try to lighten their load, the operational burden, by uh, making policies generic using CIDR block notation, mm -hmm. using uh, groups of addresses that change and whatnot by- You mean like any, any allow? <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, that's Which exactly is always it. the rule at the bottom. Right. Yeah. That's the extreme. And, and right. in some cases, yeah. people have to do that. Take a, for instance, um, uh, Amazon Web Services and other cloud providers that have limits on the number of security groups that you're allowed to provision. <sighs> Well, you either need to provision another VPC to get more security groups. But it, or you're you only limited to so many VPCs. M exactly. But my, my point is simply that if you have a constraint, the way to work around the constraint is by loosening the, the specificity yep. of the policy, mm -hmm. which is inherently diminishing the security of the system. So 
if you believe my statement that firewalls are not secure unless they're specific and detailed in their policy definition, um, what that really means is network controls must be very granular and specific. Well, for Edgewise, our enforcement mechanism is inherently specific. Mm -hmm. It's more specific than address port and protocol. Mm -hmm. And what that means is our policies don't need to be specific. I can simply list a bunch of software that should be allowed to interact with a list of software. One policy that would have been potentially hundreds, if of not firewall. more, of firewall right. policies. Um, and what it comes down to is with Edgewise, we can protect any segment of any size, any workload complexity with a maximum of seven policies. Inbound, internal, outbound for managed, unmanaged, and global, meaning globally routable internet. That is a maximum of seven because uh, inbound managed, internal managed, outbound managed, well, there is no such thing as internal unmanaged because there's nothing it's internal. It's internal. You're man. Uh, yeah, so yeah. that means there's only inbound, outbound, unmanaged for local addresses, RFC 1918, and globally routable addresses. That means a maximum of seven policies using software identity. That is simply impossible with firewalls. So the benefits are just, you know, I... I'm you spent a lot of time thinking oh about gosh. this, Peter. Do, I, I, I'm <laughs> telling you. <laughs> but yeah, just I in your learning. description right now, that is to, like truly amazing. Like, I have not spent that much time thinking about it. It's such a fundamental innovation that, um, seriously, every day I realize some other advantage in the whole of mm. IT, not just security, but operational and, and otherwise. And I, I just don't, I don't know when it's going to end. Uh, it's, it's really, really exciting. But it's really you, cool. But I, I mean, it, it is, that's a really cool way of thinking about... But when you understand the control, components right, that interact... Yeah and how you can apply policies to those components that interact, it, you're doing it at a, at, a, at a layer that no, you can see zero trust solutions at the identity layer. Mm -hmm. You can see them at the network layer, but when you start to bring those different uh, components into a single solution, you're getting the benefit of those interrelationships to really provide that granularity yep. without maybe not a lot of complexity and overhead. Yeah. It, but it also sounds like a simpler way to describe how your applications could talk, right? Because when you go into containers, like I can say this container can talk to this container and there's only this port right. is exposed. But this is, it's more <laughs> granular. This is a great that, point. Right? I, I should have, I should have uh, tied it back to, to containers and I will. Um, you know, uh, a lot of... Uh, the process of micro segmentation or zero trust or container workload protection or cloud workload protection, mm -hmm. whatever buzzword mm -hmm. bingo sure. you want to use. Yeah. Um, container security. We yeah, get yeah. let's, let's keep, keep <laughs> going. On. I can keep, keep going, going all day on that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, a lot of it requires you to understand the topology and inner workings of the workloads that you're protecting. Uh, the beauty of this solution is it's effectively a list of software mm -hmm. that is allowed to communicate internally that our system analyzes your environment, looks at the topological graph of interdependent software, and makes those bucketizations for you. So containers, no, forget about protecting containers. Take the software that is containerized, put it into a group that represents your workload, and say, these are allowed to communicate, nothing else. Yeah. Done. But what that really means is, as I look at AWS, right, and its elastic capabilities, right, is that I would have a difficult time describing like if these group of containers, mm -hmm. this group of containers, if I overrun capacity, it's going to spin up a new thing. That gets really complex in terms of like this container should talk to this container in this port and that container should talk to this container in this port. But what happens when you're spinning up 12 now web server containers that need to talk to another 12? Yep. Use templates and there's lots of... Yeah. of widgets and tools that have been built up over makes, time to try yeah, to make that It makes that my happen. brain hurt, but at a high level, me as the um, application architect, I guess you would call it in this sense, I know my web server should talk to my app server on this port. I'm doing my best with the tools that I have to make sure my web server talks to my app server, my app server talks to my database, right? What you're saying, Peter, is that you can break that down by software Regardless of how it gets deployed in, ela is elasticize a verb? Well, yeah, right? Elasticize, now. right? <laughs> Regardless of, of the verb, topology, right? The topology, right? <laughs> that this application can talk to this application over this port 
uh, via this host in this script, regardless of how many instances of that I have. And if you change the port, who cares? We don't care about the ports. We care that it is legitimately the software and legitimately the devices that are communicating. That's so interesting. go change the port from port 443 to port 8080 or 8443 or whatever you planned on doing. And it has absolutely no bearing on the ACL. See, the corollary well, that's to interesting, this. interesting because it's applications trusting applications. Because like, yeah. at the end of the day, to mm -hmm. simplify things for our, our, our audience right, and myself, right? I know that the internet is going to talk to my web server. My web server is going to talk to my app server, right? It, at the end of the day, I mean, really, as a security architect, you shouldn't really care what, what port or what mechanism or what protocol. It's, there should be a very clearly defined path of my web server talking to my app server. That's the only thing that should be authorized to do that, right? If something changes or goes over a different port or whatever, that shouldn't be authorized. Just the other day, um, we were working with a uh, popular online service that uh, has a couple, a large environment, let's just say. Um, we went in there and fully protected every pathway of communication in 45 minutes. We did that without any knowledge of how that environment functioned. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what's transformative about mm. this. Because you don't need to articulate every discrete pathway as an individual policy, you can be broad, you can be general without giving up the protection benefit. <coughs> mm. And that allows somebody who doesn't know anything about the environment to fully protect it and maintain that protection in a short amount of time. You have to know our tool and how to manipulate it. But at the end of the day, there's a system, a machine learning system that we call auto segmentation, that it builds the segments, the groupings of devices for you. And then when you click the auto segment button on it, it actually builds every single policy and uh, uh, control for you automatically. So that entire 45 minutes was literally going through the ML objects and giving them names and we didn't know what to name them because we don't know their business we were like what do, what do you want to call this one and they would say oh that's the you know such and mm. such we'd name it then we'd click auto segment we'd wait about three minutes for it to finish doing what it was doing and move on to the next one but it's interesting like at a high level we know as whether you're a network or application or security architect like this uh interface or application should trust this application right like what happens in the back end can take many different shapes and forms. Mm -hmm. If you have something enforcing the policy of this application should trust this application, in, it, you don't even really know this way, right? Like a web server or my app server should trust my web server mm -hmm. when folks make requests. That is very scalable mm -hmm. across your architecture. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. really a very different way of because the w simplifying it in, in, yeah. in thinking about it, right? Because we know the trust relationships. When you start getting into different deployments and everything, it gets really complicated. And let's be honest, complexity is what breeds compromise. It does. I, I mean, the, 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 corollary st the, the corollary story I wanted to see, you know, when I was at Layered Insight, from a container security perspective. That's why I said we talk containers all day. We actually did it from the inside um, where we understood what the, co the container was doing and then enforce rules there. But that means you have to be in the container to do yeah, that. That's right. Because most of the solutions that were sitting outside didn't understand that. What you've built is something that can actually sit outside the container and understand right. that in a way that the only way to really do it in a container-based world is really being instrumented in the container. And that, that is still a, a pretty high hurdle for a lot of organizations to instrument their containers to get that level of granularity. You've kind of pulled that out. It, it's a really interesting approach. Thanks. Uh, I was just getting the cue that we need to take a break and do security news. So, Peter, thank you very much. My I pleasure. believe the landing page, correct me if I'm wrong, securityweekly.com forward slash edgewise. That's right. That I'm going to use that. If you want to learn more uh, and get a demo and protect your workloads in the cloud, that articulate That's that correctly. On-prem on, on or in the cloud, it doesn't matter where they are or what they are. We can protect it. Fantastic. Securityweekly.com forward slash edgewise. Visit that to learn how to protect your cloud or on-premise workloads. With that, we'll take a short break. Come back with the security news for this week. Stay tuned.